all through um, Idaho and and uh, I think we're in St. Mary's tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. And so if you can make make it to see part one, it's really compelling. You really get to know who my husband was, what he was standing for. You get to understand what was happening to us prior to um, him going and standing with the Bundys in 2014, and then all of the things that transpired with the BLM, the FBI, and law enforcement afterwards and before Malheur. So if you get a chance, take a moment and go see that. Um, I also would like to thank Mark and the Center for Self-Governance um, for all of his tireless, uh, he works tirelessly all the time in trying to uh, educate and to inform us and he tries to help save the Republic. That is his goal. And I am grateful to have uh, this relationship with Mark and Pam, his wife. And I'm grateful to her for her sacrifice because she usually is at home, you know, holding, holding down the fort. I know what that's like because I did that many years taking care of my family. And um, I'm grateful for her and her sacrifice in, in this cause for liberty. Um, so thank you, Mark and Pam. And it's really nice because she's here. This is really nice. I know that we've been here before a couple of times. And I, I, I just have to thank you who have come out many times to, to listen to me talk and to hear our presentations, to listen to my daughter and, and all the different people who have traveled with me in, in, in previously. This is um, a movement. This is a personal endeavor. It is something I'm not going to stop doing. I know that there will be an end to the wrongful death lawsuit. I know that there will be a decision made eventually in reference to whether or not they found it to be justified or not. But at this point, even after the wrongful death, our family is determined to continue on in in educating, to be a voice in that regard, to continue to go out and be um, a force for good and to help save this republic. It's so important that we're personally involved and I think, I, I just can't see myself for the rest of my life um, just sitting at home doing nothing when my husband gave everything, he gave it all. And so many ask, you know, why are you doing this? Well, the founders left it to us. They left us the responsibility to maintain and to hold the elected officials accountable. And if not us, then who? Who will be the keepers of the republic? Who will watch it? We're all distracted, we're busy, we're, we have so many things to do, right? The list is endless, and Mark was talking about that honeydew list. Well, just the list of living, right? Just getting through the day. And then you have, you have those in the powers that be that specifically go out to distract, distort, to divide, us in so many different other ways. Hate is one of the ways that they are very successful at di dividing us. And my husband was not a man who hated. He didn't hate. That wasn't part of who he was. I'm you know, sure you may have gotten mad. You saw how mad he got. <laughs> Dad, <Dad-gum> it. <laughs> I just love it. Well, that is something my father used to say, right? And so I know, you know, I don't know if, if that's an old phrase that any of you are familiar with, but it was one that we used in our house. So it was real. But he wasn't a man that got really angry. 
in that sense. He kept us cool most of the time. But he didn't hate. And I know that he would be standing here with me saying the same thing. He was a man who loved people. He loved his country and he loved his family and he loved his God. And those were the things that were most important to him. Um, there's been different things throughout. I've, I've had so many different experiences from the very beginning. It's just been a whirlwind of three years. And I really should have kept a better journal <laughs> because uh, it, it's the questions that come to me that prompt my memories. I don't know how you guys are, but then it all comes back. It's like this movie in my head. And just, this is the first time that I've watched it through part two, through its entirety with the additional edits that they have done. And it reminded me of a lot of that time when I was there, when my husband was in Alurin, and when he was making those decisions to stay, and how that was that very first week that he was there, and how hard it was on our family. But I also remembered the peace that we felt when we went. You know, my kids, my grandkids, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, <coughs> personal friends, all took that trip to Oregon. I, I had to stay behind because I had the foster kids, and I couldn't take them. And we lost our job doing that, and so I was having to help get them prepared for their new home because, you know, because of what my husband was standing for, they were taking those kids out of our home. And so I was preparing them for a new place. But I remember when I did have an opportunity to go see my husband, it was just a couple of days before he was actually killed. And uh, it was, there was no fear. You know, we, we were able to come and go. Anybody could come and go. They were traveling to different parts of the country to talk about the area, I should say, to talk about liberty and property rights. They were visiting with groups of hundreds of people that were interested in knowing why they were there. That you saw in the film, the meeting with the sheriff. There was no warrants. They didn't try to arrest them. That's how it was. It was civil. They were standing on principle. And they were doing it responsibly. They weren't harming others, they weren't destroying property, they weren't threatening others. The threats were coming from the federal government. Yeah, yeah. The threats came... The power-hungry people. The threats came when that sheriff relinquished his authority to the federal government, to the FBI. And then the FBI came in in the hundreds they had a staging area out of Boise with over 400 agents as testified to in the last court I went to in reference to the FBI agent who was on trial. 400 agents that were shifting, you know, coming in and out of that little town of Burns. And some of the pictures here didn't do it justice really because when you see how they locked that town down when you see those fences go up and those lights go on and those armed men fully tacked out surveilling their town and scaring the citizens of that town, telling the citizens of that town to not go out alone to make sure that they go in pairs. The fear was not from the few men, the 30 let or 30 plus people up at Mallory, 35 miles outside of the town. The fear was coming from the FBI inside the town. And what was amazing, another thing that came out in trial was that of the 30 plus people that were at Malheur, 15 were known informants, known paid informants. So when you take that number of 30 men and women and cut it in half to 15 paid informants that were tasked with actual tasks to go in, to instigate, to get them to do something, and get it on tape so that they could then, because you heard in the 
never before seen or heard audio of that private meeting between the state officials and the law enforcement there. They couldn't get, they couldn't get them to do anything illegal. They had nothing on them. They were still trying to figure out what to charge them with. You're going to have to get a hold of Washington because they didn't know what to say to the state officials asking them what laws had been broken because they hadn't broken any laws. We have the right to, in our First Amendment right, we have that ability to be able to stand and speak. We also have that ability to demonstrate peacefully. And that's what those men were doing. We have our Second Amendment right and we're able to do that bear arms while we're peacefully demonstrating. Those are our rights. So they hadn't broken any laws. Just because your arm doesn't make you a threat. Right? I think we need to remind people of that. We have to start standing up. Because as Mark was talking about before, that label lynching, it's real and it's happening and it's uh, unfortunately it's very effective for the left or the opposition whatever title you want to give it they're able to label lynch us and so if you are peacefully demonstrating and exercising your first amendment right while burying your arm your 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 arms then they're going to label lynch you what what are they going to label you an arm terrorist right isn't that what we saw in the news? I believe we saw armed terrorists take over. Ranchers, armed ranchers, terrorists, white supremacists, yada, yada, yada. Mark does the list a lot better than I do. But every adjective that they could come up with that was, they, they attached to the group there at Malheur. But during my stay there, when I showed up, I remember they gave me a tour of the place and introduced me to everybody. And the boy was, um, I had quite a few of the ladies that came up and said, you know, your husband's been so excited about you coming. Yeah. He, he had talked to everybody about me coming and was excited that I was going to be there. And, and it was really sweet that the women had wanted, to, wanted me to know that, that he was excited that I was there. And so they had cooked a special dinner and... And people were so gracious in the town. They were bringing food in and out, and cakes and pies and, and steak. And I think they even killed the fat calf. I'm not, I'm not joking there. <laughs> they actually brought in a lot of beef and uh, other supplies. People were very generous. And um, so we spent that evening meeting a lot of people and having a nice dinner. And he was busy because he was put in charge of all the media. And so he was constantly being interviewed and giving interviews until late at night because um, there was media from all around the world there and uh, so I felt like I wasn't getting a whole heck of a lot of time with him and I remember the next day it was the same thing all over again media 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 interviews after interviews after interviews and I remember spending some of my time most of my time that next day with Shauna Cox helping her with going through all the mail that was coming for them because it was unbelievable the amount of mail that came. And it was in all forms. That there was the hate mail and then there was the support <laughs> mail. And I won't go over some of the stuff that we had to bring because it was pretty bad. But I remember spending my time doing that with her. And then my husband took me to dinner in town. We went to town and had a date. And we went to dinner and we went to breakfast the next day. It was Sunday, and then he took me to church at a local church there in town. <coughs> so that's how it was. It wasn't threatening. You could come and go. Nobody was stopping us from doing anything. And I remember Sunday night. I love that picture of them. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Mm -hmm. I remember Sunday night, he said to me, Jeanette, you need to go. And I wasn't supposed to leave until Monday night. And he says, you need to go and you need to take Adrian Swell to the airport. He needs to get on the plane. And Adrian was the rancher who'd flown in from New Mexico to sign a 
um, stating to the BLM that he was no longer going to sign their contract. So he was another rancher that was getting on board with that. And so I reluctantly left and got to Boise and put Mr. Swell on the plane and stayed the night in Boise. And I remember speaking to LaVoy all day, off and on, by phone as I drove the rest of the way back to the ranch on Monday. And I specifically remember speaking to him Monday night, um, just before going to bed. And, and I really can't remember how Tuesday went. I, I've tried to remember Tuesday morning and I just can't. But one of the reasons I had to be home was my youngest daughter was um, a senior in high school and she was on the basketball team and it was senior recognition. And he had written a letter for her and he didn't want her there by herself without one of us there. So I was sent back. And it was there that we heard that my husband had been killed. And it was during her game. And so, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, I'm sorry. Um, after that, my life has not been the same. So much, so much good has happened. So much, so much awful, so many awful things in the beginning began to, to happen. There was so much that um, our family was trying to just get a grip on because, you know, we were just an American family. You know, I was a mom of 12, and uh, yours, mine, ours, and theirs. Mm -hmm. And I can explain that later if you want to know. <laughs> And so we were just, I was just busy taking care of my home and my kids. And that's what I had done. And I wasn't political. And I hadn't taken the time that my husband had to um, get educated and to understand what it was that he was standing for. And so when all of this happened, I felt very unprepared. I felt very unprepared. I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to deal with all of these things. And I knew that... I needed to do more, and I just didn't know how I was going to go about doing that. And uh, in the beginning, when all the things were coming at us from every direction, our family got together and decided to form a, a family mission statement, because it was important for us that we stayed on track, that we didn't allow all those that were out there pulling at us from every direction to take over or to suck us dry for their agendas, right? that we wanted to be in charge of our own family and we didn't want our agency usurped in any way. And I didn't want my husband to be represented by anybody but his family who knew and loved him and knew who he really was because we were already watching how they were just describing him and they knew him not. And so at that very moment, that's when my life changed and, and this movement for me began because my movement is to bring to you who LaVoy was, the real LaVoy, and what he was standing for, and why he went to Malheur, and to not allow anybody else to do that for us. And so I have traveled this country for three years. I have gone everywhere that anybody's asked me to be. And in the beginning, it was really hard. It was pretty scary. I had threats. I had to have bodyguards. I had I insisted upon my children attending it with me because I was too scared to go by myself. So my daughters and my sons were enlisted to be my, my, uh, my travel mates, my speaking mates, <laughs> until I felt comfortable enough going by myself. And so here I am, three years later, still, still bringing to you who LaVoy is, and I'm grateful that the Center for Self-Governance has taken on this, this journey with me to bring to you in a documentary form the truth, the truth about what happened. That's, it's such an epic story in all its forms from the first documentary that he makes about the Bundy Ranch 
to, this is the second documentary series, Le Boy Dead Man Talking, with four episodes. But then there is going to be a third part with four more episodes in reference to the trials. Because what happens in the courtrooms is even more devastating to this country and to we the people. And you are not hearing about, you are not hearing about what happens. You are not getting the truth. And so it is so important for our family to bring that to you. And I probably will be doing this until the day I die, no matter what happens in my life. Um, let me read to you our family mission statement. Some of you who were here last night got to hear it, but let me, let me share it with those of you who didn't get to hear it. We, the Finnecombe family, seeking to better understand, maintain, and defend our God-given rights to further our eternal happiness, will virtuously let our voices be heard, educating on the principles of the Constitution and the testimonies be seen for personal property rights, liberty and freedom, and one that has become even more near and dear to us as of late, the importance of life. And so that is what our family is wanting to focus on. And so that is why we continue to be out here. Um, this is such a serious film. And um, I, I, I like to bring a little bit of joy back into the room. <laughs> so I like to tell the story of how I met my husband. And I know that some of you have heard it. Hopefully not too many of you, so I don't bore you. <laughs> but I like this story. I like telling this story because it brings back so much joy into my mind and into my heart. Um, we were recently divorced, both of us, and um, uh, it was a church singles dance in St. George, Utah. And I was about, I think, 32 years old at the time. And um, it was back when line dancing was in. So you ladies know about line dancing, you don't need a partner, right? Isn't that nice that there's something out there for us? <laughs> because just like any dance, the guys were sitting in the chair or holding up the wall, right? <laughs> and that was true to form in this case. And, and then there we are dancing, and in walks this really gorgeous cowboy. And I can see him walking along the, the wall, and then he walks in front of us, and he sits up on the gym, on the stage, I'm sorry. And he's sitting there just watching us girls dance, and I'm thinking, boy, I sure hope I get to dance with him. <laughs> and um, one of the ladies must have got tired of dancing by herself, so she organized the barn dance. And I don't know if you know what that is, but you put us all, all us girls in a circle, and then they put a young man in front of each one of us girls, and when the bell rang, the, the gentleman had to move to his right to the next partner. And I was thinking to myself, oh my heck, here is LaVoy standing in front of the girl right next to me, right? He's got to go all the way around. <laughs> he's not going to get to me. I was thinking, oh my gosh, he's not going to get to me. This is just not fair, right? But God had something else in mind. Because when the song ended, he was standing right in front of me. <laughs> and he asked me to dance the next dance. And it was a slow dance. And it was really sweet. And... Uh, I thought to myself, I'm not letting this guy get away. So I got brave, and I asked him to dance. And it was a fast dance, and he said, oh, he says, oh, I don't do, I don't do fast dances. And I went, oh, you're just being chicken. And he said, no, you don't want me to dance this dance with you, really. I don't, I'm not a good dancer. And I'm going, oh, come on. And he says, I'll tell you what, if you can tell me how many kids I have, and then I'll dance this dance with you. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't even know your name. How am I going to guess how many kids you have? But God really, I think, wanted us together. So the thought came to me, six. And he went, you're right. And I went, six kids? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. So then, of course, he was a man of his word, and so we danced, and oh my goodness, it, he was terrible. <laughs> and we laughed and laughed and laughed because he was like Urkel, you know, just kind of just jerky and had no rhythm. 
And so he made it through that one dance, and then he asked me to sit up on the stage with him, and we talked for a little bit until some other man came up and asked me to dance. And I was gone the rest of the evening. And I thought to myself, dang, that cowboy didn't ask me to dance again. Gee, I really, I guess I scared him off. <laughs> But when we were picking up all the chairs and putting away things, he came up and he said, Jeanette, he said, um, would you mind giving me a ride to my truck? I said, what's wrong? He says, well, I got a flat tire. And I said, well, how did you get here? And he says, I went. And I went, oh, that was a pretty good truck there, about three miles. And I said, sure, I'll give you a drive. And uh, so I gave him a ride to his truck. And Sure enough, he had a flat tire. He wasn't fibbing. <laughs> and, uh, well, we were married 14 days later. <laughs> he let no grass grow. <laughs> and it was sweet. And we, we had his six kids and my three kids, and you got, oh, this is in episode one. So you didn't get to meet my daughter, Tian, our youngest. We consider her the glue, and so that made 10. And then we did therapeutic foster care for teenage boys for 18 years. And so we had a lot of young men that came through our home, and we fell in love with a lot of them, but we only adopted two. <laughs> so that's how we got 12. So that's the yours, mine, ours, and theirs. And. Um, you heard LaVoy talk about being a grandpa of 20. Well, I am now a grandma of 28 with four more on the way. So yeah, we take multiply and replenish very seriously. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really cute because there's one picture, there's five of my daughters. Well, this one here is my youngest. She's the 20, well, she'll be 21 in February. She just reminded me she's turning 21 and I'm going, oh my gosh, where'd the time go? Right? Oh, isn't that what we do as parents? We look back and oh my gosh. So she was just married in August, and so I'm an empty nester official. <laughs> and, um, and anyways, I think I was going to tell you about how <laughs> uh, one year we had six daughters that were pregnant all at the same time. And the next year and a half later, it was five. And then the next year and a half later, it was six again, and I'm back at six this time. So I have, out of all of those grandkids, I think about 20-something of them, 22 of them, are under the age of six, six and under. So it's like an amazing little group of people, and a lot of fun, a lot of energy, and a lot of chaos. <laughs> so my kids are busy raising their families, and and uh, being stay-at-home moms. Um, I wanted to leave some time for you to ask me questions, so I'm gonna quit talking because there's a lot that people might wanna know. Yes? Uh, recently... We do have a wife. Recently, there was a group in Portland called Occupy ICE that occupied, what, the federal building or something in Portland for a number of weeks. Yes. And so that was federal land that they occupied. Good point. And so why were they treated differently? Absolutely. I love that you brought that up because I was in Portland during that time. I was attending the trial for the FBI agent um, Asterita, who had been indicted by the grand jury for five counts, three of lying and two of obstruction of justice, in reference to LaVoy's shooting. So I had to be in that courtroom. I had to face those men. I had to hear the evidence that was coming out. During that trial, I knew it would be helpful for my case in particular. And during that time, th that group of people occupied that building for 42 days. They didn't bring in the federal government to take them out. They didn't do anything. They just let them tear the building apart, stopped the federal employees from going to work, and, and even caused, um, uh, threatened them at, at different points. And so you see this difference, um, this, this huge uh, Grand Canyon. <laughs> it is so different how they treat different. If it, if it belongs to their, if it 
is in line with their ideology, then they let it, let it slide. And that's what I've watched. And it's not that they shouldn't have the ability to stand and demonstrate, right? right. Yeah, right. They have every right to demonstrate peacefully, respectfully, and civilly, just like the rest of us, right? We don't need to be damaging property in order to do that. But we see a, a great difference in how we're being treated if, if it doesn't go in line in, in their political correctness world. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Over a number of years under the Democratic administrations, uh, they've used changes in various laws to add a large number of new FBI agents. And of course, a lot of, a lot of other agencies also. And a, a question that goes through my mind is, were they brought in with an entirely different political bent than the old FBI agents? And how did that possibly play out? And what happened in this case? Well, Obama was president. Uh, Director Comey was head of FBI. Loretta Lynch was AG. So right there, um, when the governor asked for a swift resolution, within less than a week, they sent out the HRT team that killed my husband. And they were completely in charge. They took over. They even ordered um, that no audio and no uh, no film to be, you know, they could not wear their body cams and no audio recordings during the operation. They also refused to allow their, their agents to be uh, recorded during their interviews. And they also refused to allow their agents to be interviewed unless in a group. Now, let me just ask you, when you're being investigated for something, do they allow you to bring your mom and your brother and everybody else to sit with you? No. Or the people that are being accused with you to sit in the same room while you're being interviewed? No. no. But there are two sets of rules in this country and we need to stop that. We need to stop that. We have good men and women that are serving in the police departments and in our FBI. There are. But the regulations are bad. What head of FBI, Director Comey, look at what came out in the last three years in reference to him and his, his reign over there, right? The illegal activities that they have participated in, the, the good old boy system, the sweeping it under the rug, that is what is happening. And that's what happened in that trial with the Astorita. We watched that happen sitting there. I witnessed it myself when I watched those hurt team members testify under oath that they had no idea who possibly could have fired those two shots, that it could have been them. It could have been them, but they just can't remember. Now I ask you, because I know there are some of you here tonight that are armed, and I know that you go out and you shoot once in a while, right? I've shot a weapon, but I know every time I've shot my weapon. Don't you? 